This weekend, Indiana Center for Middle East Peace hosts We Are the Earth. Environmental justice is a moral imperative. And one of our keynote speakers is Malik Kenyatta Yakini. Uh, Malik, uh, welcome to Fort Thank Wayne. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, on, on the way here, as I was looking at the sign, it dawned on me that Fort Wayne is a colonial name and probably the city was established where I'm assuming a British fort was was built and you know I'm sure that played a tremendous role in displacing the, the indigenous population similarly to the city I live in Detroit General Mad Anthony Wayne same one yeah. the, the same, okay same guy same yep, guy yep. in fact you know there's Wayne State University in Detroit named, right. ap, named after him he was a like a close compatriot of, of the the despicable Andrew Jackson. Absolutely, and you know, my uh, uh, I have a, a, a brother-in-law who's a graduate of Wayne State, and I have a nephew who's uh, going to be a graduate of Wayne State. So mm -hmm. I know a little bit about Wayne State. Uh, yeah. uh, I've been wanting to meet you for quite a while, and so thank you very much. Thank you. Before we begin, I want to encourage people to listen to your keynote address. Uh, you can find it on YouTube at the 2015 National Bioneers Conference. Uh, it's, the, it's where I first learned of you, uh, Malik. Uh, uh, Food, Justice, and Race, or something like that was the title of it. I mean, uh, it's, it's what you do. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so I've shown that talk to a few of my classes. Mm -hmm. So again, it's really a delight Good. to have well, you. Thank you. You're the co-founder and executive director of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. First, I want you to tell us about the, the network's origins. And then I know the network works to build self-reliance, food security, and justice in Detroit's black community. And a key part of that is cooperative economics. So I want you to tell us both about the origins of the network and then this idea of cooperative economics. Okay, I'll try to keep my answer brief, but it's kind of a complex answer. And sure. I'll say that for 23 years, 22 years, I was principal of an African-centered school, principal and co-founder of a school. And so we were concerned about teaching African-American youth about their history and culture because they don't learn that in the dominant public school system. And we were also interested in exposing them to African cultural concepts. And not so much the surface levels of culture like clothes and jewelry and those kinds of the outer trappings, but more what are, what are the, the foundational beliefs that, that the culture rests upon? This is the uh, Saroma Institute. In Saroma Institute, that's right, you've done some research. And so in about 2000, 1999, I'm sorry, we started doing pretty serious gardening with the children for two reasons. We were trying to get at this idea that we see in African cultures throughout the continent and that's this idea of interconnectedness, that everything has to be considered in relationship to everything else. Nothing exists in isolation. And often in Western society, we're, things are very segmented. For example, um, you can get a PhD in a particular field and know a whole lot about one particular subject, but know next to nothing about lots of other stuff. But it's connecting those dots really to give us a more full picture of how the world functions. And so we were concerned about creating an experience with the children could not just in an intellectual way, but in a way that they actually realize, where they would realize their connection with the rest of creation. And so that was one objective of, of doing the gardening. So they would have experiences where they would understand the relationship between human beings and plants between those plants and the weather, between the weather and insects, and how all those things interact and how human beings are part of that matrix of life. And so we thought that rather than just talking about it or just reading about it, that gardening was a way to really help them to realize that. And in fact, gardening and agriculture in general, you, you become acutely aware of the relationship between all of those factors. You know, in American society, we spend most of our time in buildings, on concrete, and in a sense we're disconnected from the earth. So I'm a firm believer that you could say the earth is alive. I, I don't believe the earth is just the third stone from the sun. 
but it also has an energy. And in order for us to be whole, we have to be in the right relationship with the earth. So there's a new thing now they call grounding, which is basically taking your shoes off and walking outside, where I guess folks have discovered, you know, that, <laughs> that they, they connect with the energy of the earth if they do that. But of course, indigenous people yeah, have been doing that. I've never thought of that before. <laughs> Uh, so that was the first pur purpose of gardening at the school, to help the children have this experience where they realized their interconnectedness with the rest of life. The second pur purpose, though, the school in general and most of my life work is designed to build greater self-reliance among people who are defined as black in this society. Of course, the concept of race is not a scientific concept. Uh, it's something that human beings have created and primarily have created it for the purpose of elevating people who are designated as white to some position over the, the other folks on the earth. And so certainly that is one of the characteristics of American society. In fact, the fact that we're sitting in a place called Fort Wayne is reflective of that fact, the, the kind of domination by people from Western Europe. The fact that I live in a city called Detroit or Detroit, the strait named after the river that connects uh, two lakes. Um, is, is evidence of that kind of domination, not only of the physical space by people from Western Europe, but also domination of our, our mental space as well. And so the school was really designed to help black children situate themselves within their own historical and cultural continuum. Um, and so, um, so that, that, that kind of that has defined most of the work that I'm doing. And forgive me, I forgot. I went down a rabbit hole and forgot your yeah, question. Yeah, it's okay. Um, um, cooperative ec economics. Okay, you're asking about black self-determination in general and cooperative economics in particular. That's right. So it's my analysis and the analysis of the organization that I run that there are three major systems in American society that oppress people or keep people from realizing their full humanity. One is the system of white supremacy, this, this system that supposes that all that is of good and value in the world was created by people who are considered to be white. And also concentrates power. It's not just an idea, it actually is a reality in terms of how the world functions. So it concentrates power in the hands of people who are defined as white. The second system that we are highly opposed to is the system of capitalism, uh, which also concentrates wealth and power in the hands of a few. And not coincidentally, because capitalism and white supremacy intersect, the hands of the few that that power is concentrated in are usually white men, and to some extent white women. But because it intersects with this third system, patriarchy, we also see an inordinate amount of power uh, in the hands of, of wealthy, already, usually already wealthy white men. And so um, capitalism, we think, is, is bad for uh, multiple reasons. One, uh, because it creates great inequity within human beings uh, based on some of the notions that are inherent in capitalism. One of those notions is this idea that human beings can own part of the earth that if you have enough money or enough power that you can claim part of the earth and say that it's yours and you have a piece of paper called a deed and then you pass it to your usually son who then can pass it to his son and this so-called ownership of part of the earth stays in this family and accumulates, it, it, uh, accumulates value and creates wealth. Uh, so that notion is not a notion that all people around the world share Certainly the indigenous peoples of the America had no similar concept of ownership of the earth and the indigenous people of this continent saw themselves as stewards or guardians of the earth. And we hear a lot about indigenous culture looking forward seven generations. Right. Um, and the same in African societies. Uh, sometimes you might have had a king who uh, again had control of the land but it wasn't considered ownership in the sense that capitalism uh, supposes that people can own part of the earth. And so that notion also is, I think, a very destructive notion because it dispossesses many people of earth, of, of access to the earth, 
and again concentrates so-called ownership in the hands of a few. But there's many other reasons capitalism is, uh, we don't think is a good system. One of the reasons also is because it views the earth and the resources in the earth as a, a commodity. That yeah. capitalism is driven by the profit motive and everything, you know, there's some monetary value attached to everything. And so, again, we can't be in right relationship to the earth if we only see it as being something that we extract from for our, for our benefit. And there's many other reasons that capitalism is bad, but I don't want to go into all those right now. And then the third, I'll just conclude by saying the third system, patriarchy, um, underdevelops women, but it also underdevelops men. Uh, and clearly, each of us had a mother and father, and so we have both masculine and feminine energy inside of us. And so this kind of unhealthy sense of masculinity that many men have that attempts to deny the feminine energy inside of them or doesn't recognize and elevate that to the same level as what they consider to be masculine energy damages men uh, and it also damages women. Um, and one of the things that historically women have usually um, helped to steward is this idea of relationship to the earth and understand, you know, traditionally most of the healers and uh, folks dealing with medicines and plants were... The goddess traditions. Yeah, the goddess traditions were, were women. <coughs> and so by the suppression of the feminine energy, that also puts us even further away from right relationship to the earth. So back to your question about cooperative economics. So because we are highly opposed to the system of capitalism, uh, we think that cooperative economics is the only way for an oppressed group like African Americans to galvanize uh, economic wealth collectively uh, within the confines of the capitalist system. I think we should be working to dismantle it, but in the meantime, you know, it's probably not going to collapse in the next year, two, three, four, five years or so. And so until uh, it is dismantled, this is what we're dealing with. And so within the context of this, uh, people working cooperatively, owning things cooperatively, uh, uh, accumulating wealth cooperatively, we think is a far superior model to individual ownership, um, to corp the corporate style of ownership, or even you know partnerships. You know, as a religious studies scholar, I, uh, I mean, I'm I'm with you with everything that you said, and I'm particularly interested then in. Uh, how a certain understanding of Christianity, particularly white Christian nationalism, not only reinforces but legitimizes or justifies um, the kinds of the, the three kinds of oppressive ideologies and practices that you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, religion plays a role here in, in undergirding. For sure, and I'll just make a distinction and say that the practice of religion by some people has certainly been um, supportive of the systems of white supremacy and capitalism. I don't want to condemn the religion itself because I think in all religions you have people who interpret the religion in such a way that perhaps is not true to the spirit of it. Yeah. And so within Christianity, or some people like to call it Christendom, um, uh, it was tied closely to um, well, specifically to the Roman Empire uh, in, in some ways, uh, but also tied in many ways to Greek culture that predated Roman culture. And when Christianity came on the scene, many of the customs uh, that were practiced pre, in pre-Christian uh, areas were just folded into Christianity, so on and so forth. And then even, you know, at one point, the, the Pope um, had a, a the, a thing called the Asiento, where, which essentially was a license to engage in the slave trade. So, um, so again, the interpretation of Christianity, or maybe I could even say the hijacking of Christianity by, um, by some Western Europeans, I think has, yeah. has given us the form of Christianity that we've been fed. But I, I also want to acknowledge that, you know, of course, we have the, the traditions in Ethiopia and, and Egypt that have not been corrupted to the same extent that we see kind of the Western version of Christianity. Yeah. And I was particularly thinking of uh, the impact of, of 
Western Protestantism on uh, how, how that legitimates capitalist understanding. Yeah, absolutely. This, this idea of work ethic. And I was just reading something about this either this morning or yesterday, you know, that many people feel that this Protestant work ethic is how white people in the society have advanced. And, you know, I, I th well, as I've gotten older, one of the things I've come to realize is that I don't really believe in absolute truths anymore. I, I, I think that, um, you know, everything kind of operates on a, on a spectrum and that uh, there can be parallel truths also. Um, but anyway, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no. Tell us about your seven acre farm. So the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network operates one of Detroit's largest farms, and it's called D-Town Farm. Uh, we grow about 40 different fruits, vegetables, and herbs each year that we sell primarily at farmers markets and also sell at the farm itself. Uh, we're also constantly training new cohorts of urban farmers. and. Am I wrong that D Detroit is what, like an epicenter for yeah. urban farming, I, am, yeah. right? I think Detroit is the, probably the capital of urban farming in the, in the United States. And there's several factors that have led to that. One being the tremendous amount of, I'll call it unused land. I used to call it vacant land. Then a friend of mine reminded me that it's being repopulated by pheasants and rabbits and what have you. But it's not, there's a, about one third of the city of Detroit is land that is not being used by human beings. So we're talking about on a huge scale, you know, just vacant land or, you know, land not uh, used by humans on a large scale. Like a few years ago, the last number I got, there was something like 120,000 vacant lots in the city of Detroit. I mean, it's just massive. And so we have the opportunity because of the access to land to do urban agriculture on a level that's unimaginable in most cities. The other factor is actually and I'll just pause. Keep going? Okay. Uh, the other factor is that urban agriculture in the United States actually had its start in Detroit. In the 1890s, there was a mayor named Hazen Pingree, and he was nicknamed Potato Patch Pingree because there was an uh, economic depression in the 1890s, and he convinced wealthy Detroit landowners to share their land with landless people to plant vegetables and so to try to stave off starvation. And so that's widely pointed to as the beginning of urban agriculture in the United States. And then a third factor would be beginning in the 1920s or so, you had this huge influx of folks from the South, primarily black folks, but also some poor whites who were coming to work in the automobile factories. In fact, that's how my father's father came to Detroit in the 1920s, from Georgia to work in the Ford Rouge plant. And so most of those folks coming from the South brought with them their agricultural heritage. So my first exposure to gardening was in my grandfather's backyard because he always had a garden because that was part of his culture in the South and he brought it with him. And so that was true throughout the city of Detroit. There were many, many gardens and fruit trees all over the city because of this influx, influx of black folks from the South. And then the fourth factor is in the early 1970s, Detroit elected its first African-American mayor, Coleman Young. Coleman Young. And Coleman Young was able to utilize some federal money to create a program called the Farm-A-Lot program, where the city provided access to tractors, topsoil, compost, seeds, and, and tools in order to encourage residents to grow gardens on vacant lots near their houses. I didn't realize it went back to the 70s. Yeah. So all of those factors, I think, have kind of converged to make Detroit, the most vibrant place for urban agriculture in the United States. You've been on the ground level of that. I've been on the ground level, but I, there's people whose shoulders I stand uh, on, no, clearly. Of course, mm -hmm. of course. You talk about, uh, quote, good food revolution. Mm -hmm. It's part of the larger movement for justice and freedom. Mm -hmm. what, what does that revolution look like? Who are the leaders? Uh, where can we enlist? Uh, <laughs> t t t t tell us about the good food revolution. So that's a term I think Will Allen coined. Uh, Will Allen is a guy who lives in Milwaukee and ran a nonprofit for many years called Growing Power that is widely or was widely seen prior to its demise a few years ago as kind of the mecca for learning about urban agriculture. And so I borrowed that term from him. 
And frankly, I think people find that term more palatable than when I usually use the term revolution. And let, let me be clear that I am, I am for revolution. I'm not for like violence in the streets. I don't, you know, and that's why I don't use the term a lot because people get that kind of notion. But I am for a fundamental shift in power, frankly. I, I don't think that the, the, the vast disparities that we see in American society be, can be changed by kind of this kind of incremental reformist approach to things. So I am for a fundamental shift in power relationships and some people will call that revolution. But in terms of the good food revolution, uh, it's basically a movement to ensure that people throughout this country and frankly throughout the world have access to high quality food as a human right, as just as a result of being a human being on the earth, regardless of this so-called race, regardless of their economic standing, regardless of their gender, their sexual preference, their uh, 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 religion. If you are a human being on the face of earth, you have the right to high quality food. And so that's a revolutionary concept in this society where the food system is really controlled by multinational corporations mm -hmm. whose sole concern is profit. The food industrial network. Or yeah, right? the yeah. food industrial complex or whatever, you know, whatever we want to call it. Um, but clearly they're concerned about profit, not about the health of people or the health of the planet. And so the Good Food Revolution is this movement to ensure that we have justice and equity within the food movement. But I mean within the food space. But le let me be clear where I'm coming from. That I, I don't see food justice as being, dis as being disconnected from the larger struggle for justice. In fact, the reality is you're not going to have food justice until you have a just society because the food system is just a reflection of all of the ills that exist in the larger society. Yeah. And so we have to change the larger society at the same time that we're changing the food system. But it's our, for many of us, it's our hope that the work that we're doing in the food system can serve as a template for the type of relationships that can be built to create justice in other sectors of society also. For example, within the food movement, there's a lot of attention paid to race. A lot of groups that are doing urban agriculture are doing anti-racist trainings, and a lot of whites involved in urban agriculture are beginning to grapple with how they even internalize concepts related to the system of white supremacy. And so in that way, that kind of progressive thinking and introspection, we're hoping we can help transfer that to folks who are working in transportation justice, education justice, uh, justice system, justice, or, or whatever, as a way of changing the entire society. How has the uh, pandemic uh, impacted your work and that of the Food Security Network? Well, in 2020, um, when the pandemic really first hit in March, when everything shut down in March, uh, and people didn't have much information about what was going on, uh, we decided that we were going to shut our farm down for a month. We actually opened um, on March, uh, I think it was March, forgive me, I can't remember the exact date, but the week before the governor shut the state down, essentially, in Michigan, we had opened our farm that weekend and we operated for two days. And it was my uh, determination that it was just too dangerous, in spite of the critical need for local farms and local food, that we were putting the people working at our farm at risk. And again, this is, you know, in, in retrospect, at that time we didn't have a lot of information about COVID sure. and, uh, you know, people were dying left and right. I mean, I have several friends who died, so it was like t a terrifying situation. So we decided to err on the side of caution. And so for a month, we shut down altogether. Then, and what we decided to do was that we would just forego our early season crop. And so we opened back up in May and we, you know, planted and had our summer and fall crops as usual. But when we opened back up, we opened under some very strict protocols, a limited number of people at the farm at any time, uh, mandatory, uh, we, we didn't call it social distancing, we call it physical distancing, because we think people need to stay socially close during this pandemic. But, you know, we do think there's some science behind it and if there's some distance then you're less likely to you know, inhale droplets from somebody else or whatever. We, in, we require gloves and masks and disinfecting of tools after each use. So we had this very strict protocol to protect both the paid farm staff and also the volunteers 
Well, actually, for the first several months, we didn't. We cut off volunteers also. So from May through July, we had no volunteers. How at many the farm. paid staff do you have? I think we have five on at the farm right now. We have other paid staff in our organization. The farm is just one part of what we do. Um, so we opened back up to volunteers in July, but again, under still some protocols, numbers and pre-registrations and screenings, you know, l surveying people every day. So we put those protocols in place. We also closed our office. We stopped operating out of our office and started operating remotely. And many of our functions like cutting checks that used to require us to sign a physical check and go get the second person to sign the check and then get it to the accountant. That was just way too complex when we were working from home. And so we kind of automated all of those processes and all of that stuff is done electronically now. Uh, we also had to change how we were selling food because the main way we were selling our food was at farmer's markets in Detroit and a farm stand in front of our farm. In 2020, neither of the farmer's markets that we sold at opened. And so we had this food that we're growing, but without the markets that we normally sell at. And so we partnered with another local urban farm, Oakland Avenue Urban Farm, to create a website uh, where Detroiters can go online and purchase from one of the two farms. Then we had curbside contactless pickup where they had designated days they would come and pick up their order. So we had to change how we were distributing food as well. You have to leave right after your talk tomorrow, <clears throat> uh, back for Detroit for an important groundbreaking uh, for the Detroit Food Commons project that you've spearheaded, you told me, for the last uh, dozen years or so. Yes. Tell us about the Detroit Food Commons. Uh, the Detroit Food Commons is a new 31,000 square foot two-story building that we are groundbreaking on tomorrow, and it will include a cooperative grocery store on the first floor, the Detroit People's Food Co-op, which we also initiated. And on the second floor, we'll have four shared use kitchens. We'll have a 3,000 square foot community meeting space that can be used for wedding receptions, banquets, small conferences, music performances, art showings, film screenings, all kinds of things. Uh, and then we'll move the offices of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network into the building. So it's a uh, um, we think it'll be a game changer on several levels uh, because of the cooperative economic model uh, that the grocery store represents because of the fact that most of the development in Detroit now, you know, you hear a lot about the comeback of Detroit after the bankruptcy, but the reality is most of that development is being done by wealthy white developers. And most, the majority African-American population is just kind of on the sidelines for the most part. Although, let me correct that and say that I was pleasantly surprised when I listened to the Detroit mayor's state of the city address, I think last month, in which he mentioned the Detroit Food Commons, but he mentioned several other projects that are being headed by black developers. So I do, I do wanna acknowledge that progress, that there seems to be a shift in that area, but still overwhelmingly, both in Detroit and throughout the United States, most development is done by white developers. Um, so it's significant because we have a grassroots nonprofit organization, the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, that has partnered with a nonprofit developer, Develop Detroit Incorporated, which is also a black-led nonprofit led by Sonia Mays, and has hired black architects, a black construction company, and we really are centering uh, black economics and centering black empowerment in this whole project. So in, in that sense, it's also significant. Uh, wow. The Detroit People's Food Co-op is significant <coughs> on multiple levels. One of the things it's going to do is serve as a, a catalyst and a support system for local growers because Detroit farmers will be able to grow, uh, will be able to sell food at a retail establishment that will move more food than they previously had the opportunity to sell to. Uh, and then it, it's going to help revitalize an area the north end of Detroit that has been struggling economically for, for many years and we're hoping will serve as a magnet to attract businesses that have similar values. I just have a, two or three more questions for you. Um, tell us about your decision to become a vegan. Uh, well, let me be honest and say that when I became a vegan, I didn't even know it was called that. 
So I later learned that's what it was called, but uh, I became a vegetarian in 1975, and I'll, maybe I'll talk about that decision first, and then the veganism kind of evolved from that. But uh, in 1975, I was doing a lot of studying, a lot of reading um, about health and diet, and also was very much involved in the black liberation movement. And so there was, um, there, were, there, were, there was always a strain within the black liberation movement that really centered health. Uh, for example, the Nation of Islam, uh, Elijah Muhammad, who was a leader, published a book, How to Eat to Live. And while I don't necessarily advocate everything that's in that book, it certainly was um, a step forward for most black people, including myself, who grew up eating uh, eating uh, foods that were high, high in fats, lots of salt, um, and you know, having a very detrimental impact on our, on our health. So, um, and then I, there was a poet, uh, Haki Matabuti, who's out of Chicago, who was one of the seminal poets in the black arts movement, like 1968, 1972, during that time period. And he was, uh, he, he was a vegan. And, he was in many ways a, a role model for me, and I was reading some things he wrote. And then finally, I, I read a book by Dick Gregory called Cooking with Mother Nature for Folks to Eat. And so I became convinced that really uh, a meat-dominant diet was not the best thing for human beings. I'm really not on a mission to try to convert people to veganism because I think that's a losing proposition, first of all. You know, most human beings on the earth eat meat and trying to convince them not to you might as well forget that. Uh, so as far as I go with it, as I say, it's worked well for me. And I'll share information if people are interested, but I'm not trying to impose veganism or vegetarianism on people. But let, let me finish answering your question. I'll try to make it brief. Uh, so 1975, I stopped eating meat. And then I became more, prior to that time, I was just eating based on what I liked, you know, did I like the way it tasted. And so now I became more a conscious eater and I became more aware of the impact that foods had on my body. I could start to feel how my energy felt after I ate certain foods. And I noticed certain foods had me feeling more sluggish, certain foods had me feeling more energized. And so I started altering my diet based on how I was feeling impact. So my body told me that it was time to stop eating cheese and time to stop dealing with dairy. You know, it wasn't because of something I read, it was because I was starting to tune into the impact of food on my body. So by about 1981, I had become what I later learned was called a vegan. So it was kind of an evolution. But I, I will say this, that although I'm not on a mission to convert people to veganism, and I think that's a losing proposition, I think the planet would be better served if people reduce the amount of meat that they eat. Uh, and this is not a new concept either. In the early 70s, there was a book written, Diet for a Small Planet, that talked about this, the uh, tremendous amount of grain that it takes to produce one pound of beef. And so we could end global starvation if the grains that we're feeding to produce beef were fed to human beings instead. Uh, also, we see in Brazil and other places tremendous deforestation yeah. to make room for the raising of cattle, uh, tremendous amounts of water uh, that, are, that are used, the, the, the pollution that uh, uh, accumulates as a result of uh, the, the cesspools that are related to raising pigs. Uh, there's the, the inhumane treatment of animals and confined animal feeding operations, you know, both pigs, chickens, and other animals. And so there's multiple reasons that humanity and the earth would be better served if we reduced the amount of meat that we eat. But this is all also tied up in our notions of class because what we find globally that as people become more affluent, eating more meat is a symbol that you know, you've arrived or something. And so th th as people around the world uh, are becoming more affluent, they're adopting more of the Western diet and beginning to see some of the diseases that we see in this society. I'm gonna get really serious now and uh -oh. ask you about Molly Wap. Uh -oh. Uh, you're a musician. You yes. play guitar, bass, drums. Uh, talk to us about your music and how that fits into this 
kind of global African centric uh, <laughs> emphasis that's been part of your life from mm -hmm. uh, as a young man. So interestingly, in 1969, I was 13 years old, and I was going to a school in Detroit called Post Junior High School. And Detroit, as you know, is, has always been a movement city. It was a hotbed for all the major black organizations. It was a hotbed for the labor union, both the traditional labor union, the UAW, AFL-CIO, yeah. but also the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, which is wildly held, widely heralded as you know, a, one of the most progressive kind of uh, labor organizations that's ever existed. So I come from a place that, that has this very strong tr tradition. And in 1969, it was two years after the 67 Rebellion. It was a time of black people really expanding our consciousness, reading, studying, figuring out how we fit into the world. So I feel very fortunate at age 13, which is the age in a lot of traditions that young men and women are going from childhood to a young adulthood, you know, you're beginning to explore your kind of sense of individuality. So at that moment, I had teachers who did two things that have influenced the trajectory of the rest of my life. Uh, and these two teachers were actually friends who had grown up in West Virginia together, moved to Detroit together, and became teachers at the same school. One was named Ronald McCombs. He was my social studies teacher. And his childhood friend was named Melvin Peters, who was my English teacher. They would often combine their classes together. On one occasion that they combined their classes, they played Malcolm X's message to the grassroots. And I can tell you, I haven't been the same since I heard that including that's what put me on the path to examining my diet because in that speech he talked about the fact that most African Americans eat a diet that is that we have inherited as a result of our enslavement. So this really touched me because as a child my very favorite food was what we call in the black community chitlins. You know they call them chitterlings I guess yeah. in the largest society. The intestines of a hog. That was my very 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 favorite food. And I was mad because my mother only made them on New Year's Day. But after hearing Malcolm talk about chitlins, in fact, he said back then, you know, they, they call them what they were, guts. And some of y'all were gut eaters. And he said some of y'all are still gut eaters today. So to my 13-year-old mind, to put my love of chitlins within a historical context and to understand that the reason I was eating them was because enslaved Africans ate the discarded parts of the hog and that that became a cultural tradition, it was enlightening for me. So that happened at, at, you know, by hearing that record, but also kind of this alignment that I've made for the rest of my life to empowering black people and removing us from this despicable position where other people are controlling our lives started with that. And then a few weeks later, the same teachers con convened us again and played Jimi Hendrix's uh, <laughs> Band of Gypsies. And I had never heard anybody <laughs> play guitar like that. And so that inspired me to play guitar. So within six months, I started playing guitar. So for me, all of those things kind of wow. are fused together. So, and also kind of being a child of the 60s and the 70s, there was this musical tradition that was tied to the movement as well. You had Curtis Mayfield, who was producing songs that were you know, utilized in the, in the civil rights movement and the subsequent black power movement. You had uh, folks like Gil Scott Heron in the later part of the 1960s. And many, you know, you had James Brown say a lot on Black and Proud. And many other artists during that time period, Edwin Starr, War. You know, lots of the songs coming out of that time period had a social justice message. And so for me, culture has always been a means of advancing our movement for justice and empowerment of those who have been disempowered by this society. How often do you play? I mean, does your group live? How, how often do we perform as a group? Uh, during the winter, not much at all. Uh, during the summer, it starts to ramp up. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we have several things lined up now. And, you know, the thing, we've been together for eight years this year. And so now, you know, we started out playing at little clubs and trying to get 50, 60 people to come out and hear us. Uh, but now we're getting gigs that are, you know, they're bigger gigs and they're more prestigious gigs. And uh, in fact, we're playing at the Concert of Colors this year, which, is, uh, which was started by Ishmael Ahmed, the same person oh, yeah. I talked about sure. earlier. Um, and also, you know, some major shows. We were invited last year to Brooklyn to play at the uh, African American Arts and Culture Festival. And so we're starting to get gigs that are more significant. So it's not so much how often we're playing, it's more 
I would rather play less, less often, but each one has more impact. Sure. And so I think that's where we are now. My last question for you. <clears throat> you know, I talk with justice and human rights activists a lot, you know, like yourself, Malik, uh, from all around the world. I spent a lot of time in the Middle East, for example. And I'm impressed because while they say it can often, often be lonely and difficult and you're confronted by many obstacles, each one of them, and you on, on your way over here, talk about how you're inspired by a hope and, and, and a faith, really, a faith. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and sometimes for some people it's a religious faith, mm -hmm. but for everyone it's, it's really a faith um, in, in the human spirit, mm -hmm. a, a mm -hmm. faith in the human capacity to be transformed. Mm -hmm. And so tell me about what inspires you in mm -hmm. your work. Well, I'll say at the root of my work is a sense of spirituality. And so I feel tremendously blessed to be doing work on a day-to-day -day basis which is aligned with my life purpose. You know, a, a lot of people go to work and they hate what they do. They're like, oh man, it's Monday morning <laughs> again. I gotta go to the factory. I gotta go to the office. There's no alignment between what they were put on this earth to do and what they're doing. And so people, you know, have tremendous stress. In fact, in American society in general, there's this kind of search for meaning. You know, people are feeling like, you know, yeah, I got money, I got a house, I got car. What does it all mean, though? Uh, and so I feel tremendously blessed, first of all, to have realized my life purpose at an early age, and then second, to be able to live out that purpose every day all day, every day, I, you know, this is what I do. This is what I do with my whole life. And so it is tremendously empowering. It's tremendously inspiring. Uh, I do have uh, confidence in human beings, even though sometimes, you know, it's easy to lose confidence. You know, we look at, you know, Russia bombing Ukraine, you're like, how, how what mind could, you know, could be set that destructive, you know? So, I mean, you know, there's two, well, there's not two. There's there's a, a spectrum again of human consciousness. You know, some on the far end are, you know, seem to have no regard for life and justice, and then you have lots of human beings who are really trying to make the world a better place, and who are trying to make themselves better human beings. And so I'm inspired by these points of light that we see. You know, where, wherever I go, there's always people who are trying to make it better. And so, you know, I tend to to lean towards that. I don't, I don't lean towards the negative. It exists, but uh, you know, I tend to lean towards those who have faith that we can transform things. And I think, and I'll, I'll end by saying that part of my spirituality, um, uh, so I, I interpret, I, I'm not a religious person. I study religion, I study religion, but I'm not religious. I'm spiritual, I respect everyone's religion. Uh, but you know, in the Christian Bible it says essentially, um, I think it says man was created in the image of God. But I interpret that as being that human beings have some of that creative capacity that the almighty creator, you know, has to shape reality. We have that too. We're not just, uh, you know, just victims that were just placed here on the earth and just subject to whatever. You know, there's something inside of us that can envision what reality might be and can bring that into being. We have that capacity. And that capacity is more fully manifested when we connect with our own divinity, when we realize that. If we think we're just flesh and blood, we'll just do flesh and blood things, right? But if we think that the, the same spirit that emanates life in the universe is with inside of us, then we'll see ourselves as having unlimited capacity to shape reality in a way that makes the world a better place. Malik Yakini, thank you very it's much. It's a pleasure. Thank you.